Hey brothers and sisters, sorry about that. I accidentally hit the wrong button and stopped the recording. So I'm going to pick it up here. I'm on page 272. Ask, seek, knock, altar of love 2, chapter 5, part 3. I'll just back up one sentence. The life and death spoken of in Proverbs here is not physical. Oh, you know what? Let me read Proverbs and then we'll do it. There is life in the path of righteousness, but another path leads to death. Remember, we were talking about the wide and the narrow path. You know what? I'll back up even a little bit more. No, that's far enough. You know what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about Jesus was talking about the, the narrow path that leads to salvation and the wide path that leads to destruction. And then, and then David writes, or uh, Solomon writes, there is life, and that's eternal life, in the path of righteousness. But another path, the wide one, the one that leads to destruction, leads to death. That's selfishness, unrighteousness. The life and death spoken of in Proverbs here is not physical. It's righteousness leading to spiritual life, or unrighteousness leading to eternal death. And here's the problem. Almost nobody is preaching righteousness, even though it is obvious that righteousness is the narrow path leading to eternal life that Jesus speaks of. No wonder why he woke me up and said, I want you to teach righteousness. It's the path to eternal life. A church that condones pedophilia by simply moving the offenders to a different church isn't about to touch righteousness. The Christian science Unity and most denominational churches with their inclusive, do-whatever-makes-you-feel-good theology is staying as far away from righteousness as they can. The once saved, always saved, and prosperity preachers have no desire for their sheeple to seek righteousness, for righteousness would open their eyes, thus exposing their fraud. If the righteous path to life is narrow, and only a few find it, don't be surprised if hardly any of the people you know and love will perceive what you now perceive. Believe what you believe and seek righteousness too. Simon the Sorcerer. In the book of Acts, we read about a man named Simon who practiced sorcery in the city of Samaria and astounded the people there. He claimed to be someone great, and all the people, from the least to the greatest, heeded his words and said, This man is the divine power called the great power. However, when they heard the apostle Philip preach the gospel, when they heard the apostle Philip preach the gospel of Jesus, they believed and were baptized. Simon himself believed, was baptized, and followed Philip closely. So Simon believed on Jesus as the Lord, and even got baptized. Okay, are you hearing me here? You once saved, always saved people. Simon believed that Jesus was a Christ spoken with his mouth, believed in his heart, and even got baptized, which is his outward profession and confession that he acknowledges all that. All right? Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Peter and John laid their hands on them, they all received the Holy Spirit. The moment Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of hands, he offered them money and said, Give me this power as well, so that everyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter replied, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in our ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of your wickedness, which is also unrighteousness, and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you of your intent of heart. You, poison, you are poisoned by bitterness and captive to iniquity. Now, Peter was given a word of knowledge to discern what was in Simon's heart. And he only got that because of the Holy Spirit. Simon would have likely used this power to exalt himself not the kingdom of God. So Peter rebukes him 
and exclaims that Simon is a captive to iniquity, which is defined as bound in unrighteousness in the Strong's Concordance. Therefore, even though Simon was baptized into Jesus, even though he had said the sinner's prayer and confessed Jesus as his Lord and was baptized, Simon was not given the Holy Spirit because he was held captive to unrighteousness, confirming that the Holy Spirit is not automatically given upon one's profession of faith of a sinner's prayer. The main purpose of this book is to reveal the proper order of a believer's journey upon revelation of Jesus as Lord. Number one, seek the kingdom of God. Number two, die to self. Number three, seek righteousness. Righteousness. Number four, ask for the Holy Spirit. Number five, five, desire power and authority. Number six, repent daily. Number seven, do not grow weary of doing good. Acts 5, 1 through 11. Couldn't, you know what? You might want to pause that, rewind it, and write it down and keep it before you at all times. Confessing Christians, Ananias and his wife, Sapphira. I wonder how they spell that. Are those P's hard or silent? Were killed by the Holy Spirit for the unrighteousness of simply withholding money and lying about it. Yet Simon is not killed for his evil, even though he was found to have wickedness, bitterness, and iniquity in his heart. So why was Ananias and Sapphira killed, but not Simon? All three were confessing believers in Jesus Christ. All believed in his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And all were rejected, but two were killed, and the other only rebuked. But why? Simon is spared because of his contrite heart. Acts 8.24 Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said happens to me. Thankfully, God is so very patient and forgiving, and he is always looking at the condition of our heart, whether it be hardened or repentant. And Ananias and Sapphira show, showed no remorse for what was in their heart, proving that God is more concerned with what is going on inside your heart than your confession. People say one thing and do the opposite all the time. Salvation is not guaranteed by merely saying a sinner's prayer. It's not e even so much what you have done or what you will do, but how you feel about it afterwards as proven by Simon. God loves a repentant heart. If you mess up and te temporarily go back to something you thought you were free from, was there sorrow and remorse? How did it make you feel? Because there was a time when it didn't even bother you. So if it bothers you now, that's a good thing because there must be a seed of righteousness growing inside you. Psalm 51.17 says, A broken and contrite heart, O Lord, you will not despise. If that is you, do not let condemnation in. Don't even give it an inch. Instead, rejoice. Praise your Father that righteousness is growing within you. No matter what you did, or continue to do. Thank him that you are not that person any longer. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus, one who seeks righteousness over the things of the world. Virtually nobody responds like that, and it will drive the devil insane. The following is a fictitious depiction of Satan's conversation with the demon assigned to a child of God who understands their identity and seeks righteousness. This just came to me one day. Satan, did you, did you get her to sin? Demon, yes boss. Satan, did you then get condemnation, guilt, and depression to assist you? Demon, yes boss. They did join me afterwards. Satan, did you remember the goal with this one is to get her so depressed that she takes her own life. The spirit of suicide is waiting for you to prepare her for him so he can finish the job. Demon, yes, boss, I know, but. Satan, but what? Well, demon, well, her response was not the same as usual, and frankly, I'm a bit confused. Satan, what do you mean? What did she do? How did she respond to condemnation? Demon, she praised J J Jesus. 
they have a difficult time saying the name without shuddering in fear. Satan. She what? She praised his name? Nobody does that. They're selfish. It's all about them. It's one big pity party. Sin, followed by self-loathing and condemnation, has worked on this one since she first believed. Demon, I know, but not on, but not, oh, I got a correction. Demon, I know, but not this time, boss. I think she finally figured out that she is a child in authority, and she's begun confessing it daily, even when, no, especially if I get her to sin, which is less and less often now that she is seeking after righteousness. And I gotta tell you, boss, she's driving me, selfishness, and condemnation crazy. They're talking about leaving her alone and moving on to somebody who's more gullible. Satan. Ugh! Damn those Christians who know their identity and seek righteousness. Okay, new strategy. Leave her alone for a while. Get to work on your next assignment. But when you're done with them, go back to this one and see if she has forgotten who she really is. I'll stop blocking that promotion she's been praying about and make her so busy with her new job that she won't even have time to pray. Then we'll send prosperity her way. She'll, she's quite ambitious. Maybe we can trap her with the deceitfulness of riches and a desire for worldly things. I've seen this before, but eventually they grow weary of doing good. We'll see how long she can keep this up. I give her one, two years at best. Power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but they are all... Well, you know what? I'm not going to read this right now because I have to go to work. I have to go to work. I'm going to work today. So, um, I'll see if I can shoot another one. Man, I can't talk today. I'll see if I can shoot another one of these later this afternoon. Talk to you all later. Bye.